Pete Anderson, thank you so much for uh, for doing this, especially during this uh, crazy time, and uh, I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Yeah, I think what what started all of this was earlier this year. I interviewed Red Volkart, and actually it was last year, and so it was still a, an in person interview. And uh, he he told me he said uh, that uh, Jim Waterdale was a buddy of his. And that you would hire Jim Waterdale to kind of be a stunt vocalist <laughs> yeah. uh, for the for the band when when you were you know of course producing and leading Dwight's band, and and that's what kind of you know brought everything back, and that's why I did that you know kind of you know quote retrospective on you and everything. But what made you have that that drive and that that desire to have you know perfection? And to, to really, you know, kind of rehearse the band to death, what, you know, what was in you that made you do that? I don't, it's just, a, I guess it's just the way I am. You know, I, I, uh, I always rehearsed a lot before I was ever Pete Anderson and yeah. playing in bands. I can remember, <laughs> I was thinking the other day, I had a band in Phoenix, Arizona that never play, played two gigs, but we rehearsed every day. We rented a rehearsal room and we rehearsed. And and when you look back on that, um, those become, you know, mini seminars, mini school books where you're you're learning how to do your craft. You, I mean, at the time you're, you think you're really getting somewhere and doing something important, but you're actually in class. And just like my records, I, th those were my books. Um, so it was sort of the only way I learned how to do it. And I didn't do, I did sessions prior to, you know, becoming the quote unquote producer, Pete Anderson, but not enough, but you know, there would be, you know, five guys in a room playing with gobos, you know, uh, sectioning it off the room and things like that. And I had a way of, of being, um, a little bit more logical and having more of like a mental wish list of if I ever got a chance to do this, I wouldn't do it that way, or I wouldn't do it this way, or I would, or sometimes confirming things that I would do. It's like, Oh, that's a great way to do that types of th type of things. And so I think that that was a big, that was a big part of it is, is just, I came to LA and I became a formative musician in Los Angeles. I turned, I was 21 years old. I went from Detroit to Phoenix. I was 21 years old in Phoenix and started playing bars. But by the time I got to LA, I was maybe 23 and I was early seventies and I was scuffling around going to jam sessions, auditioning for bands, uh, just doing anything I could to play the guitar, not making a penny at it, having, you know, some sort of bad day job driving a truck or something. But in re retrospect, it's all learning. It's all, it's all going to school. And so that's what I was doing. I was studying, um, you know, they got the 10,000 hour theory and things of that nature. And if, you know, if, if they took, if I took all the time that I invested in playing music and learning music, I would be beyond the 10,000 hours. I would be just a, only when I wanted to touring lecture guy that would just, you know, come and, you know, it's like, I'm only going to give four lectures this year on the music business or my profession because of the amount of hours that I, that I put in. So, um, I always had a good memory. I didn't do a lot of drugs or alcohol. So, and my family, I had an uncle who had a great memory. So I remembered a lot of stuff. I, I, I was just, I guess, studying myself in my own way without, you know, saying I'm going to sit down and make this a study. It became a study. It's, it's how it, it ended up. So when I did get my chance to do things, um, I realized, uh, that, the studio was very expensive and I didn't want to work things out in the studio. Um, we were always, you know, demo guys, even early, early stuff with Dwight, we were always worried about money. If we were going to have, how much money did we have to do this or to do that? And so it was a lot cheaper to rehearse in a rehearsal room for 15 or 20 bucks an hour to then go in a studio, which was, you know, seven fifty, eight fifty, twelve. 50, 12 capital. Uh, when we, we ended up at capital, I think capital initially was like 1200 a day, um, back in 86, 
Right. That, that's a, that's a, a lot, lot of money. money. Yeah. And to, uh, you know, a kid from Detroit who's, you know, both parents are blue collar. Uh, that's a lot of money. That's like, we got, I mean, I remember, um, when, when, when we did get the deal with Dwight, uh, after the EP was successful, we sold it to Warner brothers and she's, and the lady, the controller of the money over there said, okay, you guys got to go book another studio and do all this stuff. And so I said, I said, ask her if she'll give us cash because we can get a better deal at the studio. <laughs> and, the, and the lady said, it doesn't work that way. No. We'll tell the studio to call us. We'll book it. We'll pay for it. You know, but I, that's where my brain was at. You know, it's like, we're going to save some money here. So the rehearsal part of it, I think, was was wanting to be prepared. I was always prepared as a musician. Um my gear was always in good repair. My instrument was always in good repair. I made sure my shoes were shined, my clothes were clean, my hair was cut. I wanted to be presentable. I, I wanted to be, uh, I wanted you to look at me on stage and go, this isn't a guy that just stepped off the dance floor and got up and grabbed the guitar. He looks a little bit different. He looks a little bit special. He's, he's not just a regular Joe Blow. And I think, you know, you kind of owe that to your to your crowd to kind of show respect, cause, you know, like showing up with a tie on on certain occasions. So I would dress up in a in a fashion, to, which was the way of being prepared. So personally, I was always prepared. Okay, so I wanted so, the band to be prepared. Yeah. So this this goes hand in hand with uh, in in doing research. I was uh, I was I was on Getty Images, and they had uh, photos of Dwight pre you playing in his band and jury the the late jury mcgee was playing guitar in, in in the band and the band and no offense to to anyone but the band looked like you know just a a, a bunch of guys got up there right and and dwight looks like sling blade he has no hat on i mean right. he's you know he you know and then the next shots that they have available in you know going going by year are shots with you in the band everyone's wearing nice suits Dwight's got his look together. You know, you're wearing a really nice suit and, you know, you've got, everyone has their look. And so was that your idea to have everyone dress a certain way? Yes, it was. Uh, um, I mean, we, we did it before we had money. Okay. There was a, a long story longer. There was a, a girl out here named Josie Cotton. She had a single out called Johnny, Are You Queer? And it was a big hit. And it was during, you know, the early 80s, and she was yeah. playing all the gay discos. And there was these two brothers, Bobby Payne and Larson Payne, that wrote the song and produced it, the Payne brothers. And they were they loved country music. And I was doing demos and playing in their band. And Bobby, and I was still uh, concerned about how I dressed, of course, but Bobby had this wired. He had a tailor, and he had a custom boot maker. And he had it that was affordable. So he found this Mexican guy down in central LA that was making boots out of his garage. So you could get a custom pair of boots for like 120 bucks instead of 300 bucks, whatever. Right. And, and he would buy thrift shop clothes, just like I would look for like cool thrift shop clothes. But he went to a tailor and I was like, a tailor? And he found this woman, so his clothes were tailored and he had custom boots on. That was it, that was it. It was like, that looks like a million bucks. This guy looked different. He looked yes. different. And so I started doing that. And then, and I was just wearing, you know, thrip, you know, shark skin, you know, bolo tie, shark skin, Western shirts. And when Dwight and I got together, you know, I was always dressed pretty nice on stage. And when we decided, the interesting thing about this is that we sort of did a paint by numbers kit on his career before it ever happened. And the odd thing is, is that everything that we thought might happen and wish for happened. It's bizarre. It's the wow. coolest story ever. But he was sleeping in his car in a friend's driveway up in Beverly Glen. And I had a house behind a house, like a courtyard house that mm -hmm. was, that was a bachelor. It didn't have a bedroom. It had a front room with a hide a bed and it had a laundry room for some reason. It had a strange little laundry room in the back. Dwight was sleeping in his car. And I said, well, don't sleep in your car. You can sleep in my laundry room bring your sleeping bag because I sleep on the floor anyway in the front room. So he ended up there. So we had a lot of time together talking about, you know, well, could, could we do this? Could we do that? And he, and we were playing his songs. Like we were playing, I sang Dixie, uh, which was his first number one hit. We were playing that in the bars. We were, 
in, in regular night course of events of, a, of an evening of four sets. So we started looking at the cover of the Flying Burrito Brothers and the nudie suits and all the cool stuff. And I sort of had a line, an angle on, on Western wear clothes. And I said, you know, we should get some stuff like this. This would be cool, you know, get like find a way to get clothes like this and, you know, our boots and get our clothes tailored. And I said, um, what if what if we put all this together and we made a record, made an EP. This is before we made the EP. And we put it out and we had no manager, no booking agent, no lawyer, no, nobody, and we had a hit. Hmm. We, could, we could name our price. We could, for each person, we could go, we want this guy, we want that. We could name who we wanted because we had the power of a hit record. Well, it happened. It's freaky. So he got on the jag about the clothes and he, he had some Hollywood connections and he found a girl that said she could make him a jacket. So she made him a jacket, an early on jacket. Then we found there was a British guy that lived here named Glenn and he was called Glenn of Hollywood. And Glenn used to make, loved making Western clothes, but he was a British tailor and he was the younger guy. And he made clothes for a lot of different people. So we were starting to find out about it. And so we found Glenn of Hollywood and he made this burgundy suit for me. I found some shark skin material and he made burgundy, a burgundy Western suit for me, top and bottom, you know, pants and a jacket. Um, right. I already had some custom boots. I turned Dwight onto the custom boots. And then there was a boot maker you could get custom boots from in El Paso called Austin Hall. And they made custom boots real reasonably. They were in El Paso, but they made all the boots in Mexico. We come to find out that almost all the boots are made in El Paso but they go across the border to get the labor and they just their offices are in El Paso. So Dwight got on that jag. He got some custom boots. So that's kind of where the clothes were. Then we started picking musicians in the band that were much more stylish and Dwight became aware of it as well. So the first bass player, the bass player that's on the first record, J.D. Foster, he was he was already hip. He was like, OK, cool. I got the bolo tie thing. I, I want to dress up. I wear a sport, sport jacket. Jeff Donovan on drums, you know, got him a sleeveless Western shirt. He was he was a trim guy, so he looked good in his clothes if you wore tight clothes. And um, and then Brantley Kearns and and Brantley Kearns played fiddle, and Brantley's from High Point, North Carolina. And even when he was like 35, he looked like he was 60. He was just he looked like he was on Beverly Hillbillies. Right. And he used to wear bib overalls just casually and Dwight caught on to that and he goes Brantley you should always wear those bib overalls so Brantley was like oh, oh, okay yeah that's fine with me so he had like a little white shirt with a little sleeve uh, short sleeve white shirt and an old man hat and his glasses and bib overalls and that was the first band and that's how we looked and that's basically how that all started from Dwight's club band days to when him and I got together and I started arranging the material and let's let's just play show sets let's not worry about playing nine to five, I mean, uh, four sets a night in a, in a honky tonk. So you were just playing your show. You weren't playing like, you know, a four hour gig. No, we started to when yeah. he, first, first it was a four piece. It was Jeff Donovan, Gordon Shryock, who was the uh, engineering and trying to produce Dwight at the time, working on his demos, Dwight and myself. And that's when I started to get control of the music because it was acoustic bass and drums and me. So I was the lick guy. I played the intros, I played the outros, I played the solos. Yeah. I could sort of like say, this lick's going on too long. Put the solo here. Let's, let's uh, you know, put this as the intro. So I started sort of in that fashion, in a club fashion, arranging the material because I had control of it because I was generating all the licks and solos. Um, and uh, we got gigs playing straight up honky tonks. And the funny thing is, is that we probably played as that four piece band and then subsequently a five piece band where we added Brantley Kearns, who was a friend of mine. Dwight said, we should add another piece. Should we add a steel? Should we add, I said, well, we do Western swing. Should we add a saxophone? No. Should we add steel? Yeah, but I'm playing a lot of steel licks. I don't think we need a steel guy. We played like Dwight would break into like more bluegrassy stuff. So it was like steel wasn't part of it. I said, what about a fiddler? And I said, I know a fiddler. So I called Brantley Kearns and got Brantley in the band. And um, that band with us five, which is on Guitars Cadillacs, which is a multi-platinum record, mm -hmm. got fired from every club gig we had. 
every <laughs> club gig we had. We never, we, we never finished in an engagement. If it was a two-night gig, we did one night. The guy would fire us. If it was three, we did two. If it was four, we did two. If it was five, we, we didn't even get it, get that far. Every time, I'd be pulling into the club with my guitar, and I was notorious for showing five minutes before the count beat. I'd be walking in with my guitar, and Dwight would be walking out with his two PA speakers. i go, where are you going? He goes, ah, oh, we got fired. And he'd throw them in the back of his El Camino because we weren't playing Alabama, and we weren't playing popular stuff. Right. Now the story gets better because you'll probably want to ask me a question, but I'm so long-winded on this. But the funny thing is, is that it ended up that these clubs that all fired us ended up playing the songs they fired us for playing on the jukebox, right? And asking the bands who were our buddies in these clubs to play our songs, which really rankled some some people. Like, ah, I'm as good as Dwight. I don't want to play guitars, Cadillacs. And my friends, yeah. that were my friends, well, when we actually had a hit, and we were on the road. They would, I would hit, they would hit my my voicemail machine back in the day, the tape machine, and they go, so and so's got to play your solo, or he's got to play your licks. He's really pissed. <laughs> we're playing your song, to, your songs tonight at the Cowboy Palace or whatever it was. So it's it's situations like that just rarely happen in anyone's life you know and 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 that's really how that all came about yeah so you know in in country music at that point you know you had you know like you kind of mentioned you had alabama and you had nashville was was uh quickly moving over into you know using emg pickups and going direct and using strats going in chorus so one you're you're dressing different you're doing music that's, you know, many would say was passe. And then your your sounds, the instruments you're using and everything, it's, you know, you're you're following that kind of, you know, the Bakersfield thing. And uh and but doing your own thing also. So I mean, what what helped you stick to your guns? And then, you know, you're you're telling me all of this story of how things weren't going your way. When did all of a sudden what made the levy break and all of a sudden you busted open and you're selling and you're selling, you know, in eighty six you have this album come out and guitars Cadillacs is everywhere. It's in movies, it's you know, it's all over the radio and what uh, happened? <laughs> it's a fun, that's a funny story, but um it's really it's it's the way it happened. I you know, it was a course of events. I mean, there was a course of events that happened. So um, we decided to cut an EP. We decided to make it uh, the size of an album so it would get more rack space when it was in the record store. This was back when there was vinyl record stores. Right. We wanted rack space. And, uh, and so we, we did a six song EP, but we did it on a 12 by. Um, we borrowed the money. We borrowed a, a place in the studio. Uh, we had a, a studio that was old, where it used to be able to go into a studio from midnight till six in the morning at a cut rate because mm -hmm. right? he was downtime, nobody was there and we could go in after a session and the guy would say, yeah, go in and I'll, I'll come back in the morning. We got a cut rate so we could mix the record that way. So we did, we did it that way. We put it out and it was an independent EP. That was a huge step for us was to get this independent EP going. Nobody wanted to sign us. Nobody was interested in us. Dwight had um, some relationship with the Halsey agency, Jim Halsey and the Halsey agency. And the cool thing about them too, is they, they at that time, I don't think had a now even an office in Nashville. They might've had an agent there, but they were out of Tulsa. So we were all outsiders and we were in, to be perfectly honest, we were sort of discovering the Bakersfield sound ourselves, although we were in the middle of it, we were the new Bakersfield sound. Um, a lot, some people don't like to hear that, but that's the reality of it. We were an extension of young guys on the bandstand playing the way they play in Southern California, following in the footsteps of other guys that were on the bandstand before you that you got to hear play. Um, and that's how you formed your band. And that was the band that played on the record, a la Merle Haggard, a la Buck Owens. And yes. so um, Buck owned his masters, so his music wasn't played as much as you would think. You might play Tiger by the Tail, but we played a ton of Merle Haggard, ton yes. of Merle Haggard, and and of course everybody else, Hank Senior, Bluegrass, Bill Monroe. We had a you know a vast catalog of, of kind of stuff, and Dwight brought the bluegrass, I brought the blues, which became kind of rockabilly in a sense. Um, you know, we both loved hardcore country, so we met 
that was a common ground for us. And, and so we created a sound that way. Um, and I was influenced by James Burton and, you know, a little bit by Albert Lee, that was kind of stratosphere beyond me. Uh, but that era of playing. So, um, it was all California we, yeah. and, we weren't, and we weren't even aware that there was a, a dividing line, you know, between California and Nashville until, until they started bagging on us, you know, sort of like, you know, making us feel inconsequential. Um, and I think that was even made it even worse, right? It made it even worse that we weren't going to be part of that, but we had no, we had no idea that there was a part of that. It was just, this is what we do. Isn't it cool? Do you guys kind of dig what we do? I mean, people like it. We're revved up. We're playing. We're not trying to do anything different. We're just as when we op- when we look at a country video, not a commercial one, but we look at Buck. He's got a cool suit on. They're yeah. playing like us. So, I think that's the the path that we were following, and we didn't know that there was a difference between Nashville and Los Angeles at the time. We all looked up to Emmy Lou Harris. Emmy Lou, because she was an L.A. person. We looked up to her band. We looked up to her music. You know, she had Burton on guitar. Um, she had Albert Lee on guitar. She always had a great band. She, When she played country, she played really pure country. And in retrospect, not not a negative, but Emmy's a folk singer. Yes. She's a folk singer, but she sang country songs. So there was a, she, she had a super honesty in, in what she did and super honesty in the way the records were made. And as long as she was in Los Angeles, you know, we just, we just looked out, looked up to her records. I did for sure. Yeah. I looked up to the production and, and the arrangements as well. In the recent uh, Ken Burns documentary on country music, uh, you know, Dwight indicates that he, you know, that, that he saw Emmy Lou as a template, you know, for, for himself and I guess for y'all. Yeah. He felt the same well, way. Early Ricky Skaggs, too, that Ricky Skaggs, because he was a bluegrass guy that was that put a country band together. Right. So it was like that appealed to us because we were doing bluegrass, a little more revved up, but we were doing bluegrass and in a, in a quote unquote country band type situation. So I copied a lot from those as templates for, yeah. uh, for arranging, like, Here's the fiddles just here. This is just where the fills were, how the solos were. And we were doing that as well. And um, But it wasn't as complicated because initially uh, it was we were just splitting the solos between the fiddle and the guitar. Yeah. So we started playing, you know, with the suits, with the EP and started to get interest. And I think um, there was a one big crossroads that happened. Dwight had called the Halsey agency and, and he was the same age as um, Jim Halsey's son, Sherman. And so Sherman was, was trying to, was going to start getting into management. So he wanted to sort of be manage Dwight and be part and help us. But um, we, we, they had a label, they had a, 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 a imprint of sorts in Nashville. So they said, let's take this EP that you did send it to Nashville and see if our little imprint label on MCA will put it out if they like it. So we're like, cool. Okay, great. So Dwight was like, great. They, hey, the Halsey agency is going to, you know, and you're like, you're like looking into the wolves den and you think you're looking into like, you know, your mom's living room, you know, like they like me and they're my friends. And it's like, they hate your guts. <laughs> you know, they, they think you're, they think you're inconsequential. So, um, you're not doing it their way, so you're you're not worth shit, kind of thing. Right. So consequently, they sent the EP, and Emery Gordy was uh, is Patty Love's husband. Emery Gordy, the great bass player, was somehow doing something, and he was producing something, and he heard it, and he sort of liked it, and so the the word got back through channels to Dwight and said, "Hey, uh, why don't you come down here to Nashville and cut some demos with us?" Mm-hmm. Now we sent him an EP with with uh south of cincinnati i'll be gone i mean it had it had great song it didn't have guitars cadillacs it didn't have honky tongue man but it had six really good songs that if you knew what you were doing uh you would say this this guy this young guy can write some, this guy can write some songs that's what appealed to me when i was playing his songs like these are really good songs it, somebody uh you know these aren't just you know hacked together i've played a lot of demos that were okay these are really good country songs real deal stuff so 
I would expect someone else to recognize that. But as I've been in this business for this long, I realize that it's flooded with people that don't know. And, right. it, and it's probably everybody's business. I just know it because it's the music business. You know, I'm not casting aspersions specifically on the music business. I think it's human nature. People get into positions of power and get jobs and, and they don't know. And they make decisions and they don't know and they're not educated enough. So they don't have a skill or a talent. So consequently, they called up and they said, hey, come on down and cut some demos. So Dwight calls me up and he says, hey, guess what? And I said, what? And he goes, well, we talked to Nashville and Emory Gordy and these guys and, and they want me to come down there and, and cut some cut some songs and cut some demos with them. And, uh, um, and I talked them into letting me bring you with me. Hmm. guitar and I was like ah I said well you know look let me let me say something um I think if you want to go I think you absolutely should go I would never hold you back but I'm in this because I produced it so that's that's my key just playing guitar on it really wasn't enough for me and we yeah. had an agreement that it was that it, that it said produced and arranged by Pete Anderson on the on the CD on the uh the vinyl um the EP. So I said, I'm really in it for the producer thing. So I said, I said, whatever you decide, I totally support. But I said, I don't want to go down there and play guitar because I've been in the studio before when somebody didn't want me there. And I don't like that feeling. So I don't really don't want to be a part of that. And he went, okay. And I said, but I said, let me ask you something. And he said, what? And I said, well, you know, the six songs we cut south of Cincinnati and this one and that one. He goes, yeah. And I said, well, uh, out of the other songs, because you alluded to the, the 21 songs, I think, in, in your piece on me. Yes, true. yes. And I'll explain that in a second. But so there's 21 songs. So we cut six of the 21. And I said, is any of the other songs that you've written that I've heard, and I played them all on the bandstand, is any of them better, significantly better than the six that we cut? And he goes, no. And Dwight's like, they're his children. He loves them all, right? It's like, yeah. And they're all pretty equal. He's written some fluffy stuff, but the but the the high points are definitely the high points, like in country history, country music, songwriting history. So he said, no, no, none of them are that significantly better. Um, I said, well, then I said, I said, I hate to bring this up, but what they're saying is they don't like your songs. Yeah. What's wrong with these six? You know, let's deal with these six because I don't. I've got you know, twenty one songs, but they're not any better than the than these okay so you can hear the other ones but they're not better than these six so if you don't like these six i don't think you're gonna have chances that you're gonna like these other ones why would you you didn't yeah. see it here and i don't want to co-write he wasn't a co-writer so he and he was you know i was i'm nine years older than him so i was a little more tempered and i'd already had a child i had a son and so i was a little bit uh, not mature, but I wasn't a, wasn't a, as much of a hothead or a hot rod. So he said, yeah, okay. So he hangs up, said, see you later. Let me know what you want to do. Two hours later, he calls me back. <laughs> and he's like, I called up the Halsey agency. I told those guys, fuck that shit. He said, I'm not going down there. You don't like my songs. I got better songs. And he just went off. <laughs> I'm not going. So in retrospect, that was a crossroads. Yes. If he could have went, if he'd have went, he might have got enticed by money, publishing this, co-write that, the, all the little things that happen, especially when you're hungry and you're sleeping on a floor and you got no income. Um, and it could have been a completely, for me and for him, a completely different out, outcome. So that was really important. The 21 songs, I'll explain that because I heard you talk about that. When I yes. met him, he had 21 great songs. He had written I Sang Dixie which was his first number one hit, but wasn't on, was on the third record instead of the first. So he had I Sang Dixie, Johnson's Love, and South of Cincinnati, three slow tempo songs. And so I said, listen, we have to separate these songs tempo wise. I said, they're all really good, you know, but we need to separate tempos and grooves and things. And you've got 21 songs, I said, if we pick up three cover songs, you've got three albums right there already done. You won't have to write for a couple of years. You won't have to write another song. So he was like, oh, okay. So he bought into it because we did covers. So we picked three covers. Well, Honky Tonk Man, great, got a hit. Uh, Bury Me, no, um, 
two others on the first record. It's been a while. I don't remember, but oh, uh, Ring of Fire and yeah. uh, and um, Walk on By or something like that. Anyway, um, so the first record we got lucky. We got a hit, and and I and and the other thing you alluded to was what I told him. I said, look, I sing Dixie is a, is a small. It's a smash. I said, but it won't be a number one record on your first record because it takes so long to just for they're going to put a single out and it's going to take a long many weeks for them to get to know you and that first record is going to be a battering ram it's not going to be rocket to the top like after th after three chart after three top 10 songs and you come out with a blockbuster there's no getting to know Dwight Yoakam you just play him and it goes because they would give you 12 to 14 weeks on the radio and then you had to come with a new single so that meant it had to go up and down in a certain certain amount of time so i was the one that said we need to wait and put i sing dixie on a much later record when when they know who you are i said and right. and it became his first number one hit and as an addendum to that the funny thing was is that this is how political it was because i think i sing dixie is one of the best country songs written so um, when we got uh, that song number one, uh, the radio promo guy at Warner Brothers called the radio promo. This is how it worked. This is going to be an interesting fact for your listeners. The radio programming guy at Warner Brothers called the radio programming guy at Capitol and said, hey, I, I looked at the charts and I see that Tanya Tucker's going number one next week. And he goes, yeah, we got a number one with Tanya. And he said, I want you to do me a favor. He goes, what's that? Hold her back. Because she's going to she's gonna go to number one no matter what. So just hold her back one or two weeks so I can get Dwight a number one because he's never had one. And I'll owe you a favor. And this had nothing to do with radio. These right. were two guys that were calling radio stations suggesting that the playoff tickets are in the mail and the Sony Trinitron's being delivered to your garage and you're invited on the summer tour cruise ship, but would you, this is what I want you to play this week. I heard a radio guy, I heard a radio promo guy call a radio station once and it was shocking because he was telling the guy what to do. Oh, no, no, I, I need a better number there. You can't put the nitty gritty dirt band at 10. They've got to be at five. So I'm like, what is this business? Anyway, so that's how I Sang Dixie became really a number one record. It was, you know, for all practical purposes, a number one record, but that's the mechanics of how it got to be number one. Did, did you have a uh, publicity machine behind you? Because one of the other things I noticed in, in 86, you were featured in both Guitar World and Guitar Player, both did spreads on you, which was, that, that wasn't really usual. One, for them to cover country players, I mean, they did that some, but, uh, you know, you, you had, you know, cause I, I, I looked back in my, my catalog of old, old magazines and it was like, there, there you are. And in 86, you were covered in both magazines and had, you know, really good spreads on you. And I think, uh, I think because we played with Los Lobos and the Blasters and we kind of got out from under as fast as we could. And we'd already been on the scene in Los Angeles as, as playing, you know, for lack of a purpose, Dwight Yoakam music, you know, uh, right. and we were revved up and, and, and it wasn't, you know, if, if, if James Burton was a battering ram at the press for Albert Lee, for Vince Gill, you know, they, they all paved the way for some guys to take a look at a guitar player like me, as opposed to uh, an insider session guy in Nashville that doesn't get as much, who's a great player, but doesn't get as much notoriety because he's not out playing right. you know, the videos he's not you know on stage he's in the studios so i think i think that was a big part of it and we were in los angeles and so you know i met dan fort at guitar player and, and they're in california and guitar world the funny thing is is that you're always more appreciated in the place that you're not so i was mm -hmm. always more appreciated i would go to new york city and go into manny's and they go pete anderson's here and i'd be in manny's music hey play that lick get him a guitar you know <laughs> I'd talk to the guitar stores in los angeles and they go hey pete what's up hey how you doing man you know they're all like just blase you know about it but new york was always the other side because i didn't live there yeah so guitar world was in new york and i remember them coming out and and that was that was always kind of funny because they were definitely a New York type magazine. So their their view of country music was like, wow, this is like coming from the starship. What is this? How did you do that? You know, pedal steel bands. That was just totally foreign to them. 
Yeah. So it was interesting, but I did not have a publicist, no. Okay. So another thing that's funny, kind of hitting back on the on the Nashville thing, was that uh, the the at least the session guys were jealous of you because you were getting to play a telly through an amp, and so yeah. Brent, Brent Mason told me he Brent said. They were making me play direct with a Strat, and I wanted to play a Telecaster through a Deluxe like Pete Anderson, but they wouldn't let me. Brent said that? Yes. <laughs> That's funny. He's been very nice to me. Um, Brent Rowan? Yes. You know who Brent Rowan is? Yes. I've so, interviewed him. Yeah. Okay, so another nice man. Yeah. Brent, Brent, Brent Rowan called me up out of the blue. Now, you know, once you get in the club, I've talked about that. Once you get in the club, it's like I could be going up in an elevator on an escalator and Rodney Crowell's coming down and he'll go, hey, Pete, hey, Rodney. And I've never met him, but yeah. I know who he is. He knows who I am. So once you're there, so of course I knew who Brent Rowan was, is, and he fortunately knew who I was or am. So he called me up out of the blue and said, it's Brent Rowan. I'm like, I get a phone call, like, Brent Rowan? I call yeah. me? It's cool, right? Because I mean, yeah. great player. And I'm like, What's he calling me for? Wow, that's cool. I was, uh, I thought it was great. So I said, hello, hey, what's up, man? How are you? Blah, blah, blah. And he said, hey, I wanted to talk to you. And, you know, I like what you do, this and the other thing. He said, I want to, he said, I want to know what's in your rack. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, gee, I said, Brent, I said, I don't have a rack. <laughs> and he goes, what? I said, I, I don't have a rack. Um, I, I, he said, well, what do you use? I said, well, uh, I got a, I got a really good Telecaster that I really like. It's a 59, you know, sunburst with the binding, you know, slab rosewood board, all stock. And, um, a lot of the time I use a black face pre CBS twin reverb and he goes, what? And you just plug into the twin. And I went, yeah. <laughs> I said no. Sometimes I use delay, but I said, I just, I really, I said it, it. I just have a really good sounding guitar and a really good sounding amp. Now you have to work at both of those things, right? As yeah. guitar players out there that are going to watch this interview, it's easier said than done. You know, I didn't buy a reissue, reissue uh, printed circuit board. Um, twin and a mexican strat and plug in i probably could have made it happen right because it's again it's in your fingers but the ease of playing and the excitement about it was i had i had two really nice pieces of gear so i said i he said where did you get them and I, so i told him where i got the amp anyway it was in hollywood so my yeah. i told my buddy and then like sometime later he goes hey you know brent rowan called me up he's looking for a black face twin blah 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 and and that twin actually is part of history I bought from Jody Mathis, who's yeah. the son of Joe and Rose Lee. And yes. I was in Nashville once, and Jody and I had, had met many years ago when we played uh, together when he was with Marty Stewart. And I forget how we got on the subject, but I, if he ever called me or what it was, but somebody said, I got an old blackface twin I want to sell. And I said, I said, you got, is it a pre-CBS blackface twin? He goes, yeah. I didn't even ask him. He said, it's kind of, it's not in great shape. I said, I don't care. I'll buy it. How much? He said, whatever. I said, take it to the, I said, call the road manager, take it to the bus. Cause we were in Nashville. He'll give you the money. He goes, okay. I forget about it for the day. Next day I see the road manager and he goes, Hey buddy, your amp's here. And I said, what? He goes, you ain't going to like it. I mean, that thing's a piece of shit. And I said, <laughs> I said, where is it? And he opened it up in the bay. And it, was, it wasn't busted, but it was funky. It was totally funky. But it was a blackface twin. Nothing. Yeah. They didn't, the transformer wasn't changed. It was, I said, you watch. I told him, you watch. Brought it home. Took it to my amp guy. I said, clean it all up. Retold exit. I put two v EVM 12Ls in it. It's the heaviest amp in the world. And it's the greatest sounding blackface twin I've ever experienced. And I used it on many records and many sessions. And all the steel players that come to the studio where we're doing this interview from now all want to play through that amp. It's a great amp. And I use it for reamping and everything. But it turned out to be such a great tool for me. But he thought, you know, because it was all dirty and busted up, he said uh, he was laughing at me. And I was like, oh, no, I just I bought the Holy Grail. I got one. So the, the Telecaster. So how, how did you come to the Telecaster? To playing the Telecaster? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I grew up in Detroit and um, I was definitely into blues and a big B.B. King fan. And I lusted after a 335. 
uh, I couldn't get a 335, so I got an Epiphone Riviera back in the day. And it was a good one. Yeah. It had mini humbuckers. I went from Detroit to Arizona. My mother moved there. She retired from the auto factory in, at Chrysler's and moved to Arizona. So I would go every winter with a friend or whoever and drive to Arizona, spend the winter there, and then go back to Detroit and spend the summer. And I was playing in bands, garage bands, whatever you want to call them, basement bands, banging around. I had a band in Phoenix, band in, LA, in, uh, in, in Detroit. And so I got out to, uh, the, I think the second time I went out to, uh, well, as far as guitar stories, guitar stories go i'll give you a really good one i'm in detroit i'd been to san francisco i went from my mom's in phoenix to san francisco and i sold all my gear for whatever reason i was going to get something different and i ended up in san francisco sold my gear to somebody who wanted it and flew back to detroit i didn't have a guitar i didn't own a guitar which was rare for me so i'm hanging out and i get this little local newspaper and this was in 1968 and so I get this little local, like, freebie newspaper, Macomb County newspaper, and it says, Les Paul, $50 for sale. And I was like, what? Now, I didn't know much about Les Pauls, and they had just really recently reissued the gold top. Right. The, Bla the Black Beauty they were making, I actually saw, a I had a friend that had a Black Beauty with three pickups. I don't know that they'd reissued the Black Beauty yet, but anyway... I got on the phone and I said, I'm calling about the, the Les Paul, 50 bucks. He goes, yeah. And I said, how many pieces is it in? That's what I, first thing I said to him, how many pieces is it in? He goes, no, it's fine. And it was a kid. And I go, where do you live? He goes, so, so, so. I said, okay. I said, so I got, I borrowed a car from somebody. I drove out to this guy's house. I went in. I said, yeah. he said, oh, great. You're here to see the guitar. I said, yeah. I said, can I see the guitar? He pulls out a 1955 gold top Les Paul in a gig bag with a broken toggle switch. So he said, it doesn't work. He said, I, I'm not sure what's wrong with it. And I said, and, and I know it's like electronics. He's like, this is an easy fix. The guitar is yeah. real, right? So I said, okay, I'll give you 50 bucks. I went boom, 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 gave him 50 bucks, walked out, took it to a guy, got it fixed. So I had this gold top Les Paul and I ended up back in Phoenix with it. And I got a, a blonde basement, uh, head with a 212 bottom so i'm playing that and we're playing blues and i'm putting a band together and sweethearts of the rodeo hits and then graham parson hits and this other music comes in and then clapton switches over to a stratocaster and i'm like and he was playing that out of phase position i was like man that's really cool that's a cool sound and i didn't like the les paul at all i wasn't a les paul guy so there were these really uptight music stores called Wallach's Music City, and they were they were almost like an appliance store that sold you know yeah. instruments as a side product. Um, and they were they were unique, I think, to the West. They didn't have them in Michigan, but I know they had them in L.A. and I know they had them in Phoenix. I'm in Phoenix. I go to Wallach's Music City. I walk in the guitar in the guitar amp room that they had, and this is when Fender had had done all these solid state amps, and they were named after after Zodiac signs. Yeah, the Gemini yeah. and the Taurus and right, all that. Right, yeah, right. yeah, they were horrible. Horrible. So I walk in the room, and of course the the salesman is a young kid who's a rocker who has long hair who has to wear a wig because they won't let him have long hair. I mean Phoenix. Yes. Is so. I, I walk in the guitar room. He's ghosting me in the room like, you know, I can't be alone with anything or he'll get fired. And I look over and I see a metal flake, blue, green, maple neck Stratocaster. And I'm like, that is about the ugliest guitar I'd ever seen. And I was into the blues, right? And I said, I got to play this thing. This is like this is like a little Richard guitar. This is like something you'd play on a dark blues gig. I picked it up. I said, can I play? And he plugged me into a solid state amp and I went wank and it sounded awesome. And I'm playing and I'm like, damn. I said, how much do you want for this guitar? So the money will be arbitrary because I don't remember exactly. Let's say 250 bucks. I didn't have any money. So I went back to the counter and I said, okay, so you want 250 bucks for this metal flake blue green Stratocaster. So he said, yep. And so I'm standing there and there's a kid standing next to me who if I was 20, 21 at the time, he was like 15 or 16. And I said, I said to the guy behind the counter, I said, well, here's the deal. I got a 55 gold top Les Paul. 
and I will give you that guitar if you give me this guitar plus 50 bucks. So I wanted my 50 bucks. Yes, <laughs> yes. I'm a hell of a businessman. So, so, so he's like, what? Now, Wallach's didn't do that kind of stuff, right? But the kid knew behind the counter. He's like, ar, 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 ar. you got a 55. Ar, ar. And the kid's standing next to me, and he looks up, and he goes, you've got a 55? Da, da, da. And, and he said something like, that's the year I was born. And I went, he said, I'll buy it. I'll, we'll make the deal. I'll get my brother. And I went, all right. I don't care how it works. He said, okay, bring the guitar. I'll meet you here in two hours, whatever. Go home, get the guitar, come back. He brings his brother. They look at it, but I make the deal. So I walk out with this, this Stratocaster. So I use that. So I got into the Fender world, got to Los Angeles, and I really needed to get into a 335. I really needed to get into a 335. I got a job at a music store that was uh, a little, it was half, sort of like a pawn shop. It was a vintage store before there was vintage stores. It was called Benton and Music. And all the cats came into that store. Everybody that was, all the, he, he specialized in saxophones. So Bud Shank and all these heavy sax players would come in looking for cool vintage saxophones. He had a guy that ran the store named Chris Bristol. Now, Chris Bristol ended up working for Roland, uh, Roland Music Company. Yeah. And the only guy Chris answered to was a guy that spoke Japanese. He was the next guy to the top of all of Roland. That's where he ended up. So this was like a little hot spot back in the day. And I got a job there, and I learned so much there because all the heavy players would come in there looking for – Chris Etheridge, the first bass player, the bass player with, with the, the burritos. burritos, he brought a bass and sold it to Saul, a, a telly bass, a real one. So there was all this stuff in there. And that's when um, I got my hands on a 335, but it wasn't a great one. And at the same time, Roy Buchanan hit. Oh, yeah. And the telly hit. And everybody's talking about telly. And these guys are coming in and doing like real radical stuff with the telly and volume shit. And I'm like, what's that? And I was like really like floored by it, but in a blue sense. And so I figured out I got to get a telly. Now I got to get it. And I was looking at it from the perspective of like more really like Cornell Dupree. Like yeah. I, need, I need a blues. I need to tell, I can play blues on telly. And so, and I had seen Albert Collins also by then. So I knew that he played blues on a telly. So I wrangled around and I actually ended up with an old black guard, like early fifties black guard telly and started and immediately started trying to make it sound like a 335, <laughs> which for quite a while didn't work. But as I, you have to give yourself up to the Telecaster. It is a unique instrument and you have to give in to it. You have to, you have to embrace the treble and you have to embrace the way it looks like a, a kit. Like everybody gets a telly. What do they do? They take it apart. It looks like a kit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like the neck is so easy to come off. It's squared off. There's no finesse about it. But it's completely and utterly unique instrument. And once I started giving into it, listening to more people that played telly, even if it was Cornell who had a humbucker in the front, David Spinoza, who was a New York guy that had, yeah. had a humbucker on it. He um, did. There was a guy in uh, the guy that played with um, uh, played on a record and was a session guy in Nashville named Dale Sellers, who played yeah. – um, a Buddy Emmons record, and I started hearing these guys. Then I heard Burton, realized he was playing a telly. Then when Burton was chicken picking, I had learned chicken picking from Hubert Sumlin from War. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. oh, I can do that. So I kind of got that. And I had a friend in this record, record I mean, uh, music shop named Bob Gross, a bass player, great bass player. And these guys were these were California guys and they were ahead of me on all the hip stuff that was going on. And he goes, Hey man, I'm playing a gig out at this country bar. You know, you should come out and check it out sometime. And I was thinking like a country bar in Michigan meant I was going to get in a fight. It was, they were just redneck, hard honky tonk and drunks smashing shit. And it was like, oh, okay. So he said, yeah, I'm playing with this guy and that guy. Come on out. And he named some people that I didn't know. And so I decided to go out to see him play at this bar, at this country. And I wasn't a bar guy. I was young. I was, you know, 23, 25 at the time. I didn't go to bars to drink or anything. I didn't drink. So I went out to see him play. Well, one of the guitar players turned out to be Jerry Donahue. Who oh, wow. here, you know yeah. who there he is. And then yeah. there was probably some other guys in the band, I don't remember now, that were 
moderately be went on to do something. Anyway, they were playing this country bar under the guise of a country band. They played Chuck Berry. They played Western Swing, which was jazzy. They played a blues tune. They played a bunch of Merle, a bunch of, you know, hard country stuff. And it was like, it was like a guitar fiesta. It was like, like there's so many styles going on. And like I've said so many times, country music, 99% of country music was written on the guitar. Yes. Guitar music. And and it is very much so. Yep. And when you get into a band and play country in a bar, forget about making records. The first prerequisite is you need a bass player, a drummer, an acoustic guitar. What's the next piece you're going to get? Nine percent of the time is a guitar. So it is a field day for a guitar player. And I gravitated towards it. I said, whatever they're doing, I want to do. Yeah. I'm going to do that. And I had my telly, and I ended up with a Tweed, uh, Tweed 115 Pro with a uh, old brown reverb unit. That was my, that was my rig, and I started going like sitting in, and I found this guy in a country band that was friendly, and he'd say, and the lead player uh, Gary Hanley was the lead player, and he would say, "Hey Pete, c- come on up and play a couple tunes." They were being nice to me. Come up and play a couple tunes, and I was coming up and just like hacking, trying to figure out that minor pentatonic, major pentatonic, because country music is major. It is major sounding. So when you go from the one, and a lot of it is a retrogression there's a progression and a retrogression a retrogression goes one to four that's meaningless a progression goes one to five so country music goes one to five not only does it go one to five it usually goes one to major five so if we're really teaching class that major five is a key change well i can play if i'm in if i'm in the key of c and we go to the five chord is g i can play some major g stuff over that G, absolutely I don't know dominant, right? So it's getting that into your ears that you can get away with, right? So you can use the dominant in country, but you have to pick and choose when you do it. You know, the, is the style of the song that way? Are you playing it that way? But you know, if you're not, it's not going to work. So I had to, and I was a I was, when I played a major scale as a blues player, I played a dominant seven. I couldn't play a major seven. It sounded wrong to me. I was like, this isn't right. This this says that's the wrong note. It's like, well, no, it's really the right note. Depends on the music you're playing. So I had to learn to shift from minor pentatonic to major pentatonic. And then it just started to open up like, oh, wow, I can do this, I can do that. And then the steel guitar came into play. And then when I got into like the early 80s, um, about, I remember in 1979, I was at a guitar store in Hollywood. I think I might have been at the Guitar Center in Hollywood, and I saw a flyer on the wall for a Howard Roberts seminar, Mm. a three-day seminar. This is before GIT. Howard Roberts was traveling around the country, and I don't know how long this had been going on, but I had just discovered it. And he was giving three-day seminars, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And you would book him in advance, and he'd show up. And he was like, he'd go to all the cities. I mean, San Francisco, Los Angeles. He'd go everywhere. So I saw this flyer, and I was searching. I was a good blues player. I played harmonica. I played guitar. I played slide. I played Robert Johnson. I knew all that stuff. I played it pretty well. But when you're like 23 years old and you're singing about picking cotton, you know, it just it doesn't really resonate with people. It's You're really at the bottom of the barrel. <coughs> so I was trying to like not be a blues player or, and I mean this in the educational sense, an illiterate musician who plays blues and drives a truck during the week. I didn't want that. I wanted to play music for a living and I had to make a decision. If I'm going to play music for a living, am I going to be a harp player or a guitar player? Well, that's easy. Harp is too limited so i'm going to be a guitar player am i going to be play anything i can hear and play whatever anybody wants so i can work yes so i need to study music so i had a couple of lessons with different guys none of it really gelled and i went to the howard roberts seminar in like 1970 must have been 78 or 79 because i was still working at Benton music and it was a life-altering experience life-altering he had taken music put it into five pamphlets with like 10 or so pages in it, stapled together, five pamphlets, 
10 pages each and said, this is everything you need to know. This is everything I know. And he distilled it down and he made it specific for guitar players. So he said, this is why we can do this. This is why it's cool for us. We don't have black keys. We don't have little mini keys on our saxophones. It's just a grid to us. And he would draw out patterns, like play this pattern. You know why I'm playing this pattern? Because I think it sounds cool. I'll explain to you what it does later and why it's cool, but just play the pattern. And you were always taught prior to that, don't think patterns. The guitar is all patterns. It's a grid. So he just blew my mind, and he was as great of a musician as he was. He was a genius as an educator. Unbelievable. So I went to the seminar for three days, came back to work Monday. My one friend, Bob, comes up to me, Bob Gross, and says, so what'd you learn at the Howard Roberts seminar? Kind of like joking to me. And I said, I was totally, I was totally serious. I said, Bob, I know everything there is about music. And he goes, oh, shit. I go, ask me. Now, I didn't say I could use it, but if you ask me, I'll get my pamphlet out, and I'll go page three. He said, nope, you play, there's only four diminished chords. Oh, there's only four augmented chords. You know, I had it. It was like working with a master carpenter who explained every tool to you. Was I proficient in using the tools? No. Did I know what the tools did? Yes. So I... I belabored with that. It was hard to study on my own. And within about a year and a half, they started the school. And I was like, I was all over it, man. I'm going to this school. And I jumped into the either the second or third class. I was there. And my class was prestigious. I had quite a few uh, people in my class that almost all of them went on to do something in music. Like one friend works, he runs uh, Taylor Guitars. Uh, Kevin Dukes played with, you know, Jackson Brown and Don Henley, tons of different cats. Every, we had, uh, um, uh, what's her name? Oh, shit, why do I, I can't forget her name now. Uh, uh, Jennifer Batten, who played with D D Jeff Batten. Right. She was right. in my class. You know, we had we had a heavy, heavy crew, and uh, we studied music, and it was a pretty special time to study the Howard Roberts curriculum for a year. And I was playing country bars at, at – pickup bars so this is before i met dwight i was playing pickup bars at night so i would go to the you know thursday night at nine o'clock i would be in the valley playing a country bar playing you know silver wings and, and just going in thirds like silver wings dee -dee -doo -doo -dee -dee -doo -doo -dee -dee, crying in the night dee -dee -doo -dee -dee -dee. <laughs> I, I played guitar till my fingers fell off i mean i just played guitar forever and i loved it so, so here you have you've you've gotten all these elements have, have come together and uh, you know including you know studying with you know the Howard Roberts method and and GIT and uh, you know you had your you had your clothes together you had your rig together you had your thoughts together and and uh, you know and you, you've you've got the Telecaster thing uh, yeah it, it blows my mind and then you had uh, you even you know you had your rig together you had like a wet dry rig going oh, yeah. where you had two amps and you had your effects going through one and you had the other one that was dry and uh one of the things that when when i when when i first heard you know guitars you know cadillacs on the on the radio of course it it really you know it sounded so different than everything else in 1986 and two, it was like when you played your second solo, you started playing sixths and you were bending them. Yeah. And it was like, I hadn't heard anyone do that. I mean, maybe someone had done it before, but I hadn't heard anyone do that before. Where did you get the idea for that? Okay, so I get out of guitar school and I need a gig. And I got a gig through a booking agent. I don't know how this guy heard me play, but he said, hey, you're pretty good in this really good country band that was playing much better, a little above everybody else, better gigs, uh, you know, amusement parks and other places like that. I can't remember their name, but they were really good. They're losing their guitar player, and I want you to audition for them. I booked them. This guy's name was Bud. I can't remember Bud's last name. But anyway, I was, I was flattered, and I said, okay. So I went out with my rig, and I played. I didn't get the gig. It's like, okay. So he calls me up, and he goes, yeah, they hired someone else. But he goes, you know, i got another guy that I book. And he's working. I live in Los Angeles County. I live in Glendale, just north of Los Angeles. And this is in Ventura County, which is about 40 miles uh, west of me. He said, I got a guy named Rick Tucker who has a good band and they play a lot. And they're out in Ventura County in Simi Valley. 
and he's losing his guitar player, and I think you'd be great for his band. I said, great. I'd love to go sit in. So he calls, makes arrangements. I drive out there, and I walk into the club, and the guitar player that's leaving is a guy named Peter Kleins. And Peter was real thin. He had a real deep baritone voice. He's a great singer. And he's up there. He's got a, and I'm still doing Telecaster through a Tweed Pro with a reverb tank. He's up there with a Blackface Deluxe, a Showbud volume pedal, and a 355. So he's got a Gibson Ebony Fingerboard 355. And I'm just like, he's playing Steel Licks, and I'm floored. I'm like, what is the volume pedal and the bending and you know bending six bending just single line bends and i'm like i just i was i was numb i was like i've never heard anything like this now as far as like any of the other playing i was there i mean for blues playing i was probably a better blues player but this was a country gig and yeah. it just like and it, the guy's just killing it and i'm like i can't do that i what is that but so he said, he said, Hey, you're here. Shake hands. You know, he was real nice. Come on, sit in. So you want to sit in? I said, sit in. So I sat in and, uh, played and, you know, did my little James Burtony stuff and my little pepper pear and stuff. And, and, uh, didn't really have any steel licks, didn't have a volume pedal, any of that kind of stuff. And, um, the guy said, okay, you got the gig. And I'm like shocked. Cause I was on stage with the guy playing and every mm -hmm. time I would play, a, he'd play a solo, it just was like monster. And I was like, beer, 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 and he'd go, Wah! he'd sound like, you know, Lloyd Maines or Buddy Emmons. So I was like, okay. So it was like, and I can't remember the course of events, how, if I played with him a couple nights and then how that went, how the transition went. But I do remember um, getting the gig and going, man, I got to, I got to get that steel lick stuff happening. So I had, a bunch of tapes of them playing live of songs that they had done. And so I had a bunch of his steel lick tape. So as, and he would have, if, if I'd asked him, but we never sat down and said, show me how to do that. I just heard him do it and I'd imitate what he did. Right. Try to play the song. And he did that. And that song, I play the song, try to imitate it. So I know he bent six, how far he went with that and, and everything else. I don't really know, but, it put me on a path. And so I started, I started changing my rig. It was like, okay, I got to get uh, a deluxe. I got a deluxe. He had an Altec. I, I, I mean, he had a JBL. I didn't like the chrome dust cover. I got um, an Altec with a paper dust cover. He had a volume pedal. I got a better volume pedal because the show butt sucks your sound away. I got, right. uh, I got a, a, a Goodrich volume pedal, which was low, low impedance and perfect. And then I brought another amp and I started playing harmonica and I had a little mic, little harp amp, but I was playing it more like Mickey Raphael because I was good enough to do that kind of bridge the blues and country. And I could sing okay. I wasn't a great harmony singer. So I started filling a hole in that band and it did it in a different way. So every time the guy would call me up, every time Rick would call me on the phone, I thought he was, I, th I thought he was calling to fire me. <laughs> every time it'd be like, hmm. oh yeah, Pete. Yeah, it's Rick. I like oh, here it comes because i was like i was buried it was like this was tough and um he never had a set list he was older than me he was from texas and he would just do songs as the crowd would call them out they'd go conway twitty he'd go conway twitty yeah man he'd do five conway twitty songs yeah he'd, he'd just do Beatles songs he would just he was he was uh any hits from the 50s and 60s, he just real you know, Roy Orbison. We do five Orbison songs, so I was like, I'm like, like drowning. I'm like, I, how do I get ahead of this gig? So I taped my playing every night. I listened to Peter Klein's tapes of the songs. He played all the outlaw country stuff, and then um, I would play the ra I'd play the radio because we didn't have the way to learn that we do now. Like you can go on and loop stuff and listen to anything on Napster or whatever. I would play my radio on the oldie station and listen. How did they play that lick? I had to catch it off the radio to learn the right way to play the songs. And it took me probably more than two months to hear all the songs that he knew. Now, the great thing about that band was the drummer. The drummer was a guy named Peter Gavin. Peter Gavin came to America in Head, Hands, and Feet, which was yeah. Lee's first band. Right. He was a great drummer. He, him and Albert had played him and Albert had 
back the Everly Brothers and Joe Cocker. And also he had been the drummer for a while in Stuff before oh, Chris wow. marketing. He was the drummer. So this guy could play. And if you play Chuck Berry, he played the Chuck drums. Like He had the wiggle. If you played the Everly's, he had the tom. Brum, brum. Had a great sense of time. Had a good bass player. The bass player ended up moving to piano, and the bass player that ended up getting the gig was an old friend of mine named Roly Sally. Roly's the bass player for Chris Isaac for the last 30 years. Great right. bass player. So we had a smoking band. And after about two and a half months, I had heard all the songs that rick had known and i started really getting a grip with him i played from played with him for about a year and a half and he had an off night gig every other week at a club in santa monica so we played this big country bar and in the middle of all this urban cowboy hits every bar in los angeles is a country bar and we right. are one of the hottest country bands in town we're playing at a country line dance whatever bar wednesday thursday friday saturday Every other Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, we played at a pub in Santa Monica where we could play whatever we wanted because it was a sit-down drink. It was more of a hip gig. So we would play 11 nights in a row, four and a half sets a night, 11 nights in a row, every week, every two weeks. So I would have three days off and then 11 in a row, three days off, 11 in a row with a great drummer. So to distill it down, that was the, you know, the opportunity to play with a great drummer five hours a night, 11 nights in a row. That really welded it in my head. And I started playing all the steel licks. Um, if Again, I had, until my the bass player moved to piano, I had control of everything. <clears throat> I played all the solos, all the intros, all the outros. And I never really sat down with anything and learned it note for note. I, I emulated it. Yeah. But, so it helps me in doing that. So if you came to me with a song, and, and, and I've never heard it, what does that matter to me? What are the chord changes? I'll emulate it. So I became an emulator of it, right? And realized that these are signature licks. I'll play it the same way every time. And that was a huge plus for me um, in playing uh, on records as well. So that's where it came from. Yeah. So then, you know, of course, you, you kind of, you start off basically using the Telecaster thing and you start using kind of the baritone, like on, uh, you know, little ways. Yep. Uh, and, and then your, your tones kind of, you know, expand a lot, you know, starting with like, uh, you know, what is it? Long white limousine. You start hearing some different tones. Right. And, th and this time is where the tone really changes. And it seems like the Stratocaster really became, and you start hearing different amp sounds and, on that album on this time like a thousand right. miles from nowhere and and uh the well, titles let me, track let me, let me back up for one second okay. i want to explain yeah. something that's funny um when you asked me about the solo on guitars cadillacs yeah um so so when i started playing with dwight i played less steel licks because i didn't want to do faux steel on i didn't want to do i would do faux steel in the club you'd think there was a steel player when I, at the end of that era for me, I really had it wired. I had two, that's when I was using two amps. And in using the two amps, uh, clear up another thing. The way to use the two amps, the way I used them was, is that the amp with the delay was always on the outside. So the sound went, it was sort of like a trick in the studio called pre-delay. I want to hear your voice, then I want to hear the reverb. I don't want to yes. hear the voice and the reverb because the reverb gets in the way of the voice. So I would have a drier amp, so amp sound going out to the crowd, and then the delay would come on the amp away from me towards the wings. That's where the delay would come. So it went pow, ba, ba, pow, ba, ba, not pa, 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 ba, because you get lost in it, right? Yes. So that was the way I used the wet dry. Um, the guitar Cadillac solo. So the second solo is a mistake. Huh. It's a, and I, if you said play it, I can't play it. I could learn it, you know, give me a week and call me back a couple of days, but I can't, I, I've never played it again. Um, and I crossed the bar line. So when I go up to play the fifth, and I go from, from there down, when I hit that, that E major, like a, an E major pent shape. Yes. I'm just, I'm faking it. It's like, and I'm like, and I did that. And everybody in the studio, of course, it was all analog back then. And everybody went, don't touch it. Because I was like, punch me in. It was like, don't touch it. And I was like, what? 
And so I, I said, I sat there and listened to it. And I said, yeah, okay, yeah, I like it. Now, it's also, I mean, I could fix it for you right now. I, cause I, I know how I would fix it when I'm looking at it. I'm like, I wouldn't have played that. Yeah. That's not something I would have played. I would have went like this and I'll show you exactly. I would have went like this. It'd have been a little more logical, but it was sort of like when they talk about little Walter playing across the bar line with the harp, like yeah. that cool stuff that it's not a two or a four, or, you know, it might be a six bar phrase. That's exactly what I did. So it's my mistake that, is the solo that everybody likes. And I actually went on the road some years ago with my band and had a young kid who was my road manager and he showed me how to play it. <laughs> he goes, this is what you, I said, I don't know it, Rob. He goes, he goes, well, I'll, I'll show you. I'm learning it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> he showed me how I played it. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I'll never play that again. Oh, that's, that's for you. Because that, that was another thing I was going to ask you about. Was it, you know, you, you rehearsed your band so much but you know, were your solos worked out, or would you improvise some with your solos? Well, my solos are all improvised. But during the course of rehearsal, what I was trying to achieve was the right key, as close as I mean. If I went in the studio to record, we talked about saving money, and and, yeah. and there's other reasons too about getting it when it's hot, not over 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 uh, beating a dead horse. So. If I went in the studio and thought I'm 100% prepared, and if I'm 90% prepared, I'm in great shape. I'll figure that 10% out. It won't cost me a ton of money. If I'm 60% prepared, I could be screwed. I yeah. want to be prepared, but I want everyone else to be prepared. So during the course of rehearsal, I'm arranging the song, fixing the arrangement, fixing the key, fixing the tempo. If I've got the arrangement, meaning bass pattern is this, kick pattern is this, drum pattern, snare hi-hat pattern is this. I'm learning my rhythm pattern. Keyboard player is learning him, and we'll talk a little bit over here. Try this, try that on songs. Uh, here's a, here's the, who's going to split the fills, what are exactly the intros and outros, things of that nature. It wouldn't be any different than if, say, I was the kind of person that sat home by myself and wrote this all out in the chart and hired guys that just could play the chart and say, here, you guys play exactly what I wrote because I already worked it out. But this way, I get your brain. Right. I access your mind. I'm not a drummer. Maybe I miss something. I mean, I've gotten the coolest stuff by cutting drummers loose, you know? So it's like I get to get everyone's input, and it becomes a much sweeter bouquet of music because they're specialists on their instruments. And I'll edit them, and I'll direct them, because some guys will come in, and I learned a long time ago on a session – and I won't go too long on this, but I did, a, I did a record one time, and in the process of doing this record, I played drums and bass, guitar, acoustic guitar, percussion, da-da-da, and it was for a singer-songwriter. And I learned in making this record to become a musician who plays guitar, yeah. not a guitar player who plays exactly. music. Exactly. And I learned it. It's been about, t it was maybe 15 years ago, but that was very important to me. So... If I'm and sometimes I work with people that are like musicians who play music and they're not, you know, like a keyboard player who plays music instead of a musician who plays keyboard. I can recognize it way in advance. I'll try not to work with them because it's too much work to edit them. But <clears throat> that said, I know how to discuss things with them and get them to do what I want. So the purpose of rehearsal was was really that. So that when I walked in the studio, we all basically knew what we were doing. Now, me on a personal level, as being up there, I was occupied with a lot of these things in my mind. So yeah, I was playing my guitar, but I wasn't like this, I'm nailing this lick because this is the intro lick, you know, unless it was something that fell in my lap. So I would have the important stuff that would help the band get in, play the right thing on the click when we're going in to get into the song to cue everybody. But I would take advantage of the opportunity to sit back after I'd gotten everything tracked as a guitar player. And this was another thing of, of like um, where in doing sessions, guys would say, hey, we're doing a demo. I want you to play guitar. Okay, come to the so-and-so stu studio at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. And I'd be there and I'd sit there for four hours where they beat on the kick drum. It's like, man, I'm dead. I don't want to play. Right. So that was another thing. I want to get to be it's guitar day or guitar week or whatever. I'm sitting behind the board, my rig set up. I got, if I want to use this amp, that amp, I got a deluxe, I got a, a, a 
a twin. I've got whatever I want. I'm ready to go. I'm, my guitars are tuned up, and I'm ready to go. And it's a luxury because I want to be spontaneous. I want to be exciting. And then in cutting those solos, like the solo on the outro of, of Long White Cadillac is one take. And I caught a wave. I call it catching a wave. It was like I caught a wave, and it's like I'm going to ride this wave right up to the beach and walk right off the end of my surfboard right in the sand. I'm not even going to touch the water because I caught a wave, and my engineer knew it. And I was sitting behind the board, and it's like, hey. and he looked at the other engineer who had control of this, the playback, and he goes, don't touch it. Don't touch it. If he crashes, don't, just let him go. And I was like, dun, 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 dun. and I made it all in one, one long take. Sometimes... I'll sit down and I'll and and I'll play and I'll get like half a solo and I'll go, let's do it. And then I'll grind on the second half. Sometimes I'll start and I'm just like, oh Jesus. I'll get it eventually, but sometimes it's a real grind. And sometimes I'll stop and walk away and come back. Um, but I think it's important to like a lot of people and I, I guess I was I would be more like a like a specialist at this. But I would listen to the music. I would never finger and touch my instrument. Where where do you want me to play? Or where am I going to play? Okay, play it for me. And because I've listened to so much music in my life, in my head, my card catalog, calling up songs, I would trust that something would come into my brain. Because music's out there all the time. It's out there in the air. And so I would sit there and something would hit me. And it could be like I, I put a I put a BB King lick in I think it was Little Sister, it was like it was totally total BB King lick, and it came to me. Um, Freddie King, what's the approach? And I I listened to well, it was Please Please Baby or something like that. And I was like, oh Freddie King, so I pretend I was Freddie King, you know. So if you listen to the music, it'll tell you what to do. If you've got a guy going, -le -le -le, yeah, play me what you want to want me to play. -le -le -le. So we're going to be here, you know, either he's going to write, he's going to phone this in, or we're going to be here all day, or it's not going to be very good because he's not listening. Yeah. Listen to the spot you're going to play to. The music will tell you what it wants. Sometimes it's really, you know, sometimes like, like I will think harmonically, like, like a harmony singer, and I'll think of the melody and think of a harmony and not even play the harmony to the melody, but that thought will get me where I need to go. Sometimes I'll try to play the melody without knowing the melody and play what I think is the new melody because I just made it up. You know, Sometimes I'll play exactly something dead simple is what, it, what it's needed, like the intro to, to uh, uh, Ain't That Lonely Yet. Dead simple. It's just arpeggiate the two chords. Yeah, but it's perfect. Yeah, turned out. You know, and, and then... And, and even though I have help, I know when it's right. Yeah. I know when it's clink, uh, 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 I got it. Yeah. Like, no, I got to get that last note, or I got to get this. So, you know, you, you and Dwight had this, you know, collaboration that, that went from about 86 to, well, I guess, about 2003 or something yeah. like that. And you, oh. you had a, and, uh, you know, I guess things just kind of came to came to an end. What what would you feel comfortable saying about that? Well, I mean, there's I, I think there's answers to that on a lot of levels, and you know I'm not qualified to talk on many levels. I can talk on a surface level, um, and I can give you my opinion. We spent 20 years playing music. Uh, we started in in like '83 and probably ended in '03. Um, he lost. He didn't lose, but he ended up not being on Warner Brothers. We went to uh, the old record, the guy that used to promote records for us at Warner Brothers was now running a label and he brought, he liked Dwight, he brought Dwight in. We made a record, I made a record there with him. And I thought about then, about not quitting, but stopping. But from my perspective, I felt that he needed me. Like, okay. We really don't. I mean, I knew the inner workings of everything. We don't have a record deal, and we're not on Warner Brothers anymore. <clears throat> and I don't know that he's going to accept what they might offer him because they're offering a deal with declining sales. And it's declining sales, but as well as a declining business, the record business, right? right. So there's all kinds of factors going on. And Dwight is a lifetime artist. He's no, no different than Johnny Cash or anybody else. He's a lifetime artist. So 
he had made a movie and the movie had strapped him quite a bit financially because he invested his own money in the movie. And I tried to encourage against that. We scored the movie. I had opened a little studio and we were, we were working there. We scored the movie there. We made, we made the record for Audium Koch, which was the one after Warner's there. And I think, you know, on a couple of levels, I mean, to be like, to be really super kind and, and, uh, I guess non-aggressive, it's probably difficult to take Pete Anderson for 20 years. You know? <laughs> um, I don't do well with foo-foo. I don't do well with like, let's not do this right now and let's get something catered and I got to go here and do this. I, and I'm not saying so much about Dwight. I'm just saying in general, I'm not that kind of guy. My, my parents were factory workers. I'm like, punch the clock. Let's go to work. Let's get it done. We're done. Stop. Let's stop. I pretty. I, I think producing records is a lot of a, um, a collaboration and a co-production. The difference is, I've always said, the difference to me is, um, I want the I, I want the ability to say you can do it better. You can't do it better. It's time to go home. Those three things. The rest of that is like, hey man, you got a good idea? I want to hear it. I'm not like I got to have all the ideas. Do I have a lot of ideas? Yeah. Do I have a lot of the right ideas? Yeah, but I'm not going to apologize for who I am, right? Yeah. But I'm not going to eliminate your ideas. You know, if you got them, bring them out, and if they're good, I'll use them. It's not about my. It doesn't have to be my. And even even with with Dwight as well. So I think it's I think it's difficult to be around me for 20 years, and then maybe be in a jeopardous situation. Um, that's one. That would be, I guess, the easiest way out. Uh, I think, you know, I may at the end I negotiated myself to a point of making some pretty good money, and I think he was worried about not having enough money to pay back everybody he had to pay back for the movie that he did. So I think money was a consideration, and I don't really, I didn't follow too much. Like if there was rumors about anything, I didn't. I could I could discuss rumors that I heard, but I didn't look for them or listen to them. I just kind of went about my business after the after that happened. So I don't I don't know. We don't we don't speak. And he owed me a lot of money, and there was a lawsuit, and we settled out of court. Um, and but we didn't speak a lot in the last so many years, not out of any negativism, but we would get home and he would go off into his world and his, and he'd like to do movie stuff and things like that. And I would go back to like making a record with somebody. I was running a little record company or playing guitar. Uh, you know, I would go back to my little world. I had my family and, you know, had my son at the time and then had my daughter. So it wasn't like I wouldn't pick up the phone if he called me, but we didn't, you know, in the early days, we could freaking live together. I mean, we were on the road. We were in a car. He was sleeping in the front seat. I was sleeping in the back seat. We we were as close as you could be as far as that goes. So I think I think it's I think it's it's tough to be around me. I think after a while, and I can't change the way I am because I can't make shitty records. I can't not. I'm not saying anybody wants to, but I I don't want to go backwards. I'll step sideways for a minute or two. But if I feel things are going backwards, I'm an unpleasant person. Yeah, I, I'm pretty demanding, you know, even in a polite way. But it's like, ah, uh, this is moving forward. This has got to move forward, you know. And if, if you know, if you don't follow me, and you got, if you got a better idea, great. If you don't, this is the path we're taking. So I think, I think way, way down deep, that might be it, you know. But there's, there was a lot of different reasons, and I, you know, I get bits and pieces of, of reasons that I've gotten randomly from people but I don't know I don't have an answer for it I could you know if I was a psychiatrist I could say you know this I could give you some psycho babble reason why this happened no, you don't you don't need to but I mean I don't know you know it would only be it only right. uh, uh, conjecture yeah. so I think, I think from my perspective I think that's kind of it you know i think uh i'm demanding i i want great i could have continued to make his career great i had enough ideas because there's just like talking about saying we have 21 great songs let's add three covers and have three albums 
there's ways to survive losing your major record deal. Absolutely. Ways to survive and make money. And I know them, but he didn't want to do those. So it's kind of like, well, I did one record with you that we sort of really, I pushed the envelope. I did, I did a couple things that, that, uh, I think made him mad. I flew up to San Francisco and got Willie Nelson on a track and, and then I surprised him, but it wasn't a surprise because he was he didn't like it or whatever. Some some things like that. And it was just that we didn't have the Warner Brother money at the time. The, the Warner Brother money was like huge. We could do what we wanted. And then we got on this little label and the money was half. And I'm like, right. Dwight is like, money is like, you know, it's like napkins. You know, and I'm like, dude, we got to we got to save the money. We can't do this and that. And and he doesn't he didn't do well with that. And I was trying to make a super high quality last thing I wanted to make was not a high quality record and, and, uh, and cut corners, you know, because we didn't have the money. So that was part of it. I had to really jam. I, I had to jam that record through for the money. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, well Pete, I, I feel like we've, uh, we've, we've gone, you know, an, an hour and a half, uh, with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, wear you out. So, uh, you know, we, we only kind of got through the, the, the Dwight years and we didn't talk about your, uh, your uh, you know, Reverend guitars and such. Uh, would you be open to doing something else another time? Absolutely. OK, we'll have to we'll have to do a part two then, because I, the I think other, we've... the only other thing I'd like to mention, though, on this one is that I've almost completed writing a book called How to Produce a Record. Really? From a musician perspective, there's three, three. I'll make this quick. There's three types of producers, right? There's an engineer who creates a relationship with a band member or the band and pro helps produce them. There's a musicologist, John Hammond Sr., right? Mm -hmm. Who has a record collection, but he's not a musician. Right. He produces a band by opinion and by educating himself by listening to music. And then there's a musician producer which is what I am. So somebody that's sat out on the floor, done sessions, experienced what it's like to sit there with the headphones on and do everything else and leaves the engineering up to the engineer. So I've written a book called How to Produce a Record from my perspective. So it discusses the way I used to produce records and the way I produce them now in the modern world. And um, Michael Melenda, who is yes. a great editor of Guitar Player Magazine for 20 years, is my yes. editor. And we'll have some interviews with some people that I've worked with. And it's going to take a while for it to get out. But we're, we've got two more. I think I've got a chapter and a half to write, and I'll be done with it. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, I would, I would, I would love, love to see that. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're doing that. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. Cool. Thank you. So, All right. Well, Pete, thank you so much, and we'll have to, uh, you know, we'll have to get you get you to come back on a, on, a, on part two, so part we can two. we can get the so we can get the rest of your story. Sorry. So, but thank you so much, thank you so much, Pete. Thank it you, is Dad. wonderful. All right. Okay. Bye bye.